Good morning, guys. Uh, I hope everybody's having a good Sunday morning. Um, man, you know, with each one of these that we do, we grow closer and closer to be able to meet together soon uh, in person. Uh, stay tuned for our social media and the church website and our church app, those sorts of things. If you're on our email list, I'll be sending out emails if you're a, a junior high or a senior high student or parent. Um, but uh, stay tuned. Um, hopefully, we'll be back together very soon. We're in Romans. Um, we were in Acts um, around Easter, before Easter, uh, before Resurrection Sunday. Um, and then and then after Resurrection Sunday, we moved into Acts. So we're in, or we moved into Romans. And so we're at, today, we're in Romans chapter 5. Last week, we were in Romans chapter 4. Um, so last week in Romans chapter 4, really all through the beginning of Romans, we saw that man, man is without excuse, Romans chapter 1, that God's revealed himself generally to all of mankind, and that in and of itself, God's revealing himself to us is sufficient for us to know that there is a creator, there is a God, and his revelation generally to us is sufficient for our condemnation. We see that as we progress through that man is saved not by our works, but that our works, the good things we do, they demonstrate that we're saved, but that truly man is saved by grace alone, um, through faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross and God's acceptable or acknowledgement of acceptable payment by resurrecting him from the dead. Um, that even Gentiles who didn't have the law, um, they demonstrated that the law, the truth was written on their hearts when they instinctively did those things uh, that the law required. Um, we continue to see reiterated by Paul that it's uh, to Jews and Gentiles. This message is to Jews and Gentiles, those who are saved and those who aren't saved, um, that there is no longer distinction between Jew and Gentile and that uh, everyone is saved in the same way by faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and it's by that faith that we're saved again not of ourselves, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, not of ourselves, that no one can boast, but, um, but truly by grace um, through faith. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll dig into now um, chapter 5 of Romans. Father, thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy on us. Thank you that we get to have a relationship with you through Jesus' blood shed on the cross. Thank you, Father, that you love us enough to give us your word, uh, may it be a light unto our uh, a light unto our path, uh, Father. May we may you guide us by your word, um, Father. May you teach us by your Spirit, uh, illuminate your word to us today, Lord. Um, we're not worthy to share it, to teach it, uh, Father. I'm not worthy of this honor to be able to bring your word, um, but Father, you use uh, you use us if we're willing, and I pray that you would do just that this morning. Um, speak by your spirit, not my words, but your words, and help us to leave this time with what you want us to apply to, your, to our lives uh, from Romans chapter 5. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Romans chapter 5, guys, I'm going to dig right in, right off the bat. Um, verse 1, it says this, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Guys, there's this reality that um, through the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, um, God no longer considers us his enemy. In fact, we see that reiterated through here. We're no longer opposed to God. We serve a righteous, holy God that cannot be in the presence of sin. Um, Romans 3.23, we we were in that um, chapter just a couple weeks back. For we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Um, when we get to Romans 6.23, we'll see that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So it's this reality that because we sin, our sin separates us from him. He can't be in the presence, but he loved us so much that Jesus came and he made a way for us to be reconciled to God. Um, as we continue reading, we see, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. John 15, 15 reminds us, I no longer call you servants, he says, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Jesus is telling us that there's this reality that um, we do serve God. But he sees it as much more than that. 
even friends. Galatians, starting in uh, Galatians chapter 4, starting in verse 5, we read this. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Scripture tells us to all who have believed in his name, he's given the right to become children of God. I love this word child used in scripture because, uh, as I've mentioned before, um, no matter what our relationship is like with our earthly parents, there is nothing we can ever do to cease being their child. Um, our, our parents, our birth parents, they're our birth parents, um, genetically speaking, and there's nothing we can do to ever change that. I believe there's a reason behind why he uses the word child here and children of God. Check this out. Not only so, verse 3, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering pr produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Just because we have a relationship with Jesus, relationship with God through the blood of Jesus even, it does not mean, as some would assume, that the Christian walk or the Christian life is all bunnies and rainbows and and that everything's going to be good. Oftentimes, especially in the midst of suffering, when we have discussions with people or who are struggling, uh, what we hear is, um, you know, I tried Jesus, I tried religion, but nothing changed. Uh, if we were looking for a drastic change, in other words, um, I come to faith in Jesus Christ, I expect my life is going to be uh, just perfect from then on. And that's not what he promises. In fact, he promises the disciples in this life, you will have trouble. Guys, it doesn't change our lives, uh, the content of them necessarily. What it does is change our attitude towards that. He promises peace in the midst of trials. He doesn't promise the absence of trials. He promises to walk through the, uh, the, the testing, the tough time, through the desert times. He promises to walk through life with us, not to protect us from everything. Um, in chapter 5 here, we're going to see that, um, man, from the time sin entered the world, sin has been here. Why is there so much suffering in our world? Sin. Why is there so much hurt in our world? Sin. You know, why would a good God allow? Uh, he, we chose. We chose. And with sin comes all of these things that we hate and that we, that we despise. We wish that God would intervene at times and just wipe it all away and fix it all. He promises to do just that. But in heaven, uh, as we spend eternity with him, Wednesday night youth group, if you haven't seen that message, go back and, and watch it. Wednesday night's message was on our final destination. Uh, literally the fact that we are eternal beings, that we have a beginning, but we don't have an end, at least not spiritually. Well, we'll all die physically, but we go on li living spiritually forever. And we have a God that loves us so much that he lets us choose where we're going to spend that time and how. We choose by what we do with Jesus here and now. People say all the time, why would a good God send anyone to hell if it's such a horrible place? And he gives us a choice. We choose whether we're going to spend eternity with him in heaven and glory and paradise and, 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 and awesomeness or whether we're going to spend eternity separated from him in total aloneness, total darkness, um, absolute suffering that the brain can't even imagine, absolute aloneness, you know, all of our sins being uh, just played for us or uh, our mind just reminding ourselves of them in that struggle for all the rest of eternity, forever. He lets us choose and we have a choice to make. And, and we see that theme repeated through Romans. Suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character hope. I'm reminded of James um, chapter 1, starting in verse 2 and 4, 2 on through 4. He tells us, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. We ought to be pumped up and excited when we're facing trials. 
uh, when we're facing struggles. Consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because the testing of your faith develops perseverance and perseverance must finish its work so that we may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. I'm a simple guy and so I use simple analogies and I oftentimes think of the training that's required to be proficient, to be good at, at any sport or anything whatsoever. Maybe it's an instrument, maybe it's dance, maybe it's whatever. The reality is that we know that to be proficient at something, we have to practice and practice and practice and we have to be tested and we have to train. And that training is oftentimes not fun. In fact, sometimes it's just flat uncomfortable. We don't like physical conditioning before the sport begins at the beginning of the year. But we know that that physical conditioning strengthens us to be able to actually play, uh, practice and play in a game. And apart from that physical conditioning, we're just not strong. We're just not ready. Guys, life is no different. If God protected us from everything that came in to our lives by way of struggle or testing, we wouldn't be strong people at all. Uh, in fact, that we know that those who have gone through some of the toughest struggles are tough people. They're better able to endure at the end. Uh, they're better able to endure whatever comes into their lives. Uh, we have this idea that we have to protect our kids as parents, that we have to protect our kids from everything. But we know that if we don't let our kids fight some of their own battles, go through some of their own struggles, they're never going to grow up and be capable, strong adults. That's a truth and a reality that we see. And yet, as we go about life, we illogically sometimes make statements like, if God really loved us, why wouldn't he protect us from all the bad stuff? If God's word is true and he tells us that he works in all things for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose, then why do we see so much hurt and pain in the world? Guys, we need that strengthening, that testing, that developing, just like it says here because it develops perseverance in us and we can get through anything. We can get through whatever struggles. We can get through whatever comes our way. And not only can we get through it, but we can glorify and honor him and, and still experience joy. And as he tells us in Philippians 4, 6, we can experience peace that just blows the mind through it all. We see that even in our world today with all this COVID stuff. I mean, we can see that there are those that are just like a rock, like, yeah, I know there's concerns out there, but they're just like a rock and they're dealing with it and they're taking it as they come. And then people that are just an absolute wreck. How are you during this time? What do you show? Do you show that your ultimate trust and that your peace is in God, that that he holds you in your hands, that that you know your days are numbered, there's nothing you can do to add a single hour to them? that uh, ultimately he's in total power and control. Um, you know, if you're a Christian, I hope that's what you're displaying because that's what we're called to. We see all through scripture over and over how we should be glorifying the Lord as we should be salt and light in this dark world, as we should be this and that. Let me remind you that as these things were being preached and taught all through scripture, they had persecution. They had difficulty. We may find it hard during these dark times to glorify him and glorify him well. Guys, it's assumed that we're doing that in the most difficult of circumstances because in many cases, that's the context in which it was written. Paul, writing much of the New Testament, even from prison, where he was being persecuted. So the fact that for some of us, we think, well, it's a lot easier to praise and worship God and honor him and glorify him and and be a good witness, a good ambassador for him when things are good. Guys, he expects it when things are at their worst, because that's when our light shines the darkest. He goes on and he says, in hope, in verse 5, and hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. We know at the time of salvation, he gives us the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes down on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. We know that he pours out his Holy Spirit on us and then he comes and takes up residence in us at the time of salvation. That hope um, that's in God does not disappoint if we're realistic about what God promises. God doesn't promise this side of heaven that everything's going to be perfect in the life of a Christian. No, he promises that he's going to bring the rain on the just and the unjust, that, 
that he's in control, that when calamity comes on the city, has not he uh, brought it? He sits over the flood. I mean, he, he disciplines those he loves. So sometimes we go through tough times because of the choices that we make, right? We read in Romans chapter 1 that his wrath is being revealed on all of mankind because of those who suppress the truth with their wickedness. So he's a God that, that loves so much. And when I say love, I mean, uh, we get it all wrong in our world. We think that love means accepting everything I do, even if it's harmful to me. That love means condoning all of my behavior, even if it's, even if it's behavior that's going to come with negative consequences. That love means all the goodies. That's not what love means at all. The father who loves his child disciplines his child, Scripture says. And so sometimes um, the trials that we're going through may be for the purpose of correction. God doesn't want us to continue to head down that road that's going to bring horrible consequences into our life. Verse 6, you see at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. We were powerless because we were lost in our sin. We couldn't save ourselves. There was no possible way that we can obey the law with our sin nature, which we're going to get into. And so at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's all of us. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Guys, this is the answer to the comment that we get a lot when we share Jesus with people on the road, out and about, or youth group, or Sunday church, whatever. Well, you know, I like my life the way it is. I don't want to give it all up. Um, you know, I always challenge you, man, give your life over to Jesus. Let him change your heart. He will change you from the inside out. Why we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. People think, man, I can't come to God. I can't come to Jesus. I can't receive him until he, if he knew the things I did, if he, if he knew the things I'm about, if he knew my thoughts, even now, he wouldn't offer me this gift. Guys, why we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's how God demonstrates his love. Many, some might dare to die for a righteous man, but God demonstrates his love in that yet while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. While we're in the midst of our sin, he died. He didn't say, you guys get it all right, get all cleaned up, you know, and then I'll die for you. He died in the midst of our sins. Uh, you know, I think one of the greatest demonstrations of this is while Jesus was being nailed to the cross, literally he died for those nailing him to the cross. And he exhibited that love, demonstrated that love in his cry to God while he was there. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. He asked for their forgiveness, not their condemnation. That's the heart of Jesus. That's the heart of our God in sending Jesus while we were yet sinners. Since we have now been justified by his blood, justified means right again, okay? When we say we want justice to be served, we think of it in terms of the punishment, but justified literally means to be made right again. So we're made right again by his blood. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? Now we're talking about eternity. We're talking about being saved by the wrath of God. Um, there is no longer condemnation. We'll get to Romans 8.1 to stay within the same book. There is now no longer condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we've been saved by God's wrath through him. For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Jesus' blood on the cross shed there for us, and God's accepting of that payment made the way. It bridged the gap. We're no longer separated. Now we're reconciled to God. Our relationship is restored through him. Um, and we're also saved. In our, other words, eternally. We've been reconciled. We can have a relationship with God through Jesus when we're right here on this earth. And we're saved from this eternal suffering, this death, through the life of Jesus Christ. Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. Um, you know, in Scripture, we're told that we have the ministry of reconciliation. We've received this, and so that we're told 
that what since we've received this, we're to be Christ's ambassadors. We're to uh, have the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, taking this out to the masses, helping people to understand how they too can be reconciled to God. Never more important than in a time when we're wondering where the world's going and what's going to happen. People are wondering. Take it to them. You've got the ministry of reconciliation through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Acts 1.8, his spirit who dwells in you, you'll receive power. My Holy Spirit comes down on you and you'll be my witnesses literally everywhere is what he's saying there. Um, verse 12, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in the same way, death came to all men because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world. Law wasn't given yet. Adam and Eve had a simple command. They broke the law, demonstrating that that's man's inclination, man's nature. That sin forever locked mankind into sin, into a sin nature. Um, sin entered the world through this one man, Adam. Um, but sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, day, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as Adam did, who was the pattern of one to come. Paul is just giving a nod to and recognizing um, here that Adam had an explicit command. Sin entered the world, and with sin came death. Paul's arguing that death continued to all men. He's talking about the passing of this sin nature from Adam to all men, despite the fact that the law, the Mosaic law, the law had not yet been given. It wasn't until thousands of years afterwards that the law was actually given. And so man wasn't breaking specific laws necessarily. Uh, we know according to Romans chapter 2 that that law we're out Romans 1 and 2, um, the truth of the law is written on our hearts, and so we're still guilty. That convicts us. Um, but we see that that death sentence imputed by Adam's sin to all of mankind continued regardless, even before the law. Men still died even before they got the law. And so it's demonstrating that that death is a um, consequence of sin, period. Um, people look at the pain that comes from the loss of loved ones, the loss of whatever. Um, why was she taken so soon? Why did God let this happen? Guys, that goes clear back to the first sin. With death comes all of this stuff that we hate in our world, pain and suffering and all of that. And it's going to be here until we spend eternity with God in heaven. So that's, that's the point that uh, Paul is making here. Um, but the gift is not like the trespass. For if many died, I'm in verse 15. For if many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God, excuse me, did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? So death came by one man. Salvation came by one man. Forgiveness came by one man. Mercy came. And grace came by one man, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Again, verse 16, the gift of God is not, is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. The gift, Jesus Christ, the gift on the cross, it brought justification over many trespasses, not Adam's one sin, we're not talking about that's all that it was sufficient for. It was sufficient for all sin, past, present, and future, according to Scripture. Verse 17, For if by the trespass of one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in, the life, in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? So much more powerful, the blood of Jesus Christ over this sin, over that. Verse 18, Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. Again, it brings life for all men, but we see in Scripture clearly that there's a choice that we have to, be made, that we have to make. Our God loves us so much that he doesn't force himself on us. He doesn't force our forgiveness on us. Um, we don't. He doesn't force his gift on us. It's extended. Knock and the door will be open to you. Uh, literally, 
he's there. He stands at the door. Uh, he wants us to receive it. It's being offered. We've got two places we can spend eternity, we talked about on Wednesday night. Heaven or hell. A good God doesn't send anyone to either. We choose. We have a choice. We can receive the gift of Jesus Christ, spend eternity with him in heaven, or if we reject it, we deny it. We don't want the gift. We don't want the ticket to the concert. However you want to say it, you don't have an all-access pass to heaven. We don't all get to go there just by default because it's a better place. A good God did make a way. He gave up his one and only son. He bore the sin of the entire world. He took abuse upon himself. According to Isaiah 52, I believe it is, was beaten beyond recognition, uh, no longer recognizable as a man. He did all of that for us. That's how his love is demonstrated for us, according, um, according to, excuse me, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. I got distracted here. According to verse 8 right here. God demonstrated his love for us and that he sent Jesus. He does love us. But man, I can't force you to receive the gift that I have for you. You have to embrace it. You have to take it. You have to leave all the excuses behind. You, you got to quit like digging your feet in and standing strong because guys, we don't win here. We don't win. You're not going to win against God. You're not going to convince him that there's a better way. You're not going to convince him that all roads lead to heaven. He's already given us his revelation, his, his Bible, his word, and through it, it's spelled out. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. So you can hang on to your belief. You can hang on to your ideology. You can hang on to whatever. But God's not fooled. And someday, the truth, the truth that we know to be true in our hearts, will be revealed, and even those who re reject it and refuse it will know it in a very, very real way. Um, verse 19, For just as though the disobedience, or excuse me, just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man the many will be made righteous. This idea of being made righteous is flawless, washed clean, without fault, without blemish, um, it's like the white grease board without a mark on it. Like literally we're washed. Um, Titus 3.5 says that we're saved through grace by the washing rebirth of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20. The law was added so that trespass might increase. And this is an interesting little side note here from Paul. Literally, we know the reality is if I tell you not to do something, that's the very thing you want to do. Parents know this as children grow, right? Don't touch the hot stove. That's the first thing the kid does is touch the hot stove. Why would God give us the law so that trespass would increase? Well, there was much purpose in the law. First of all, it defined sin. It showed us how wretched and pitiful we were, and, and, and it caused us to cry out for a Savior because there's no way I can do this on my own. I can't meet the law. If you've ever tried to toe the line and obey the law and be perfect in your life with Christ, we know that it's futile, that we continue to fall and fail. Um, there are those that would say, well, just abolish the law and make everything okay. That way people don't feel guilty about it. No, that society then spins downward spiral, morality out the door. I mean, that's what we've seen in our society largely, honestly. No, the truth is the law is there to cause us to, to reach out. To We need a Savior and draw us to God. And through that drawing to Him and accepting then of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, He makes us righteous. He makes us um, he justifies us through the forgiveness that comes from his blood. And his Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion until Jesus, till the day of Christ Jesus. His Holy Spirit begins to change us from the inside out. We know the only thing capable of changing life is the word of God taught by the Spirit of God into our hearts. Don't be conformed any longer, Romans 12, 2 but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. He's speaking the word of God that renews our minds, washes out all the junk, makes us new again, changes us from the inside out. So verse 20, the law was added so that trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace also increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through, the right, through righteousness to bring eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Guys, there's this reality 
that apart from the darkness we see in our world, apart from the sin that we see and even that we commit, we would never be able to understand the, the depth of God's grace, his mercy, his forgiveness. There are literally attributes of God that we would never know if we weren't allowed to make choices that result in consequences that bring pain and hurt and suffering and even discipline. We get to see that a good God disciplines the children he loves. We get to see, and scripture tells us, don't despise that discipline for it's for our own good. Uh, we get to see that that God extends his grace. That's a that's undeserved merit or favor. That's something we didn't earn, that, that his grace is abounds and, and he gives that to us. We wouldn't get to see his grace if we were perfect because we, frankly, would deserve it. But we don't deserve it. What we've earned by our lives and our sin is eternal separation from him. What we've earned is immediate death. Uh, we live in a world that, that, that presupposes, even in the mention of how could a good God or why would God do this to me? Well, the, that's the wrong question. The real question is, why wouldn't God do that to you? Why wouldn't God bring suffering on an absolutely sinful, lost like world that has turned their back on him? Why wouldn't he? He's just in that. He created it all. It's his to do with what he wants. He created us and we turned our backs on him. What we've earned in our depravity is separation, eternal punishment. That's what we've earned. Anything but that is mercy and grace and worthy of thanking him, praising him. So even the suffering, we're still here, we're breathing. Uh, we have our next breath. Scripture tells us that he gives us every breath we take, that there is Indeed, nothing that we have that we have not received or been given as a gift of his hand. It's all from him. And so if there's any life left in us, we should be praising him and thanking him. Because what we've earned is absolute separation, isolation. That's the sentence for our sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So Paul goes on and he addresses, because one could quickly jump. Well, if grace is increased where sin abounds and God's grace is put on display and we get to see more of how awesome God is because I sinned, well, then shouldn't I just keep on sinning? I mean, the one looking for a way out or uh, whatever for justification, we could say, well, in my sinning, I actually glorify God because then he sheds even more of his grace. Paul knew, knows human nature. He knows his own nature even. He knows how people think. And so in chapter 6, right away in verse 1, and I'm going to go ahead and go there. I know we're not in chapter 6 yet. But I want to go ahead and address, because Paul says it right off the bat. He says, what should we say then? Should we go on sinning so that grace may increase? He addresses that. In verse 2, he says, by no means we died to sin. For I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives through me. This life I live in the body, I live by faith in Jesus Christ who loved me and gave himself for me. I've been crucified with Christ. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I have, I, have, I have died to it, quite literally. Guys, I don't know if you realize this, but the truth of Scripture is that through the blood of Jesus Christ, His Holy Spirit that lives in us, we no longer have to sin. We're no longer in bondage. We simply have created uh, habits, patterns. We've, we've fueled desires within our own heart. Uh, how does someone become a sex addict or a a kleptomaniac or whatever that can't that can't help themselves and, and they get to the point where they just start thinking, God must have made me this way. Guys, a, a, an entertained thought becomes an action. A repeated action becomes a habit. A repeated habit eventually becomes a lifestyle, becomes part of you. And by the time you get to that point, it is very, very difficult. I would say nearly impossible 
especially apart from the Holy Spirit in him working in and through you to overcome it. Nevertheless, the promise of Scripture is we are no longer in bondage to sin. Prior to Jesus Christ and receiving him, our hearts were only evil continuously. We could only sin according to Scripture. Even those things which we appear to do that are good are done from an impure heart and therefore not good. There is no love apart from Jesus because he is love. God is love. Apart from him, there is no love. So whatever it is that we exhibit, it's not true love apart from Jesus Christ. It's so, so powerful. Paul says, by no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? He's just simply making the statement that, man, if we died to this horrible, horrible thing, why would we continue to embrace it? Why would we continue to live in it? And yet, I'm not here to tell you that it's easy. Guys, I know, I understand. I myself, I'm just wretched. It's this reality that we have this sin nature. We spoke about it here. It's passed from Adam to each son, uh, to each each of us. Um, Adam's sin nature is, is passed down. It's a part now of human DNA. We're born with it. You say, well... Babies aren't sinful. Have you ever met a baby that's not selfish or a toddler that's not selfish, crying out for his own way, he could care less about anybody but himself? We're inherently selfish human beings from the time of birth. We're not saying that he chose sin and because he chose it, he's accountable for it. We're not saying that. We're saying he has a sin nature. We all reach the... Um, age of understanding where now we're consciously choosing sin, that's when we're, um, our sin is imputed to us, so to speak. Um, but we're sinful creatures from the time of birth. And that sin nature comes through Adam, according to Romans chapter 5 and the Word of God. Guys, we have to daily um, renew our minds with the Word of God. Take up our cross. Follow Jesus. We've got to daily press into him. As Romans 12, 2 tells us, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. There's this reality that apart from the, the tutoring, uh, the word of God taught by the spirit of God, we're only going to continue in our sin. We're only going to continue to spiral down. There's no staying in the same place. We're going backwards. If we're not moving forward in our spiritual growth, if we're not moving forward in our relationship with Jesus, we're going back. And so I encourage you to continue to stay plugged in. Man, about the time you think you got this whole thing figured out, that's when Satan's going to knock your legs out from under you. He tells us in his word, pride comes before the fall. There's a reason for that. When I'm prideful, when I'm arrogant, when I think it got it all figured out, that's when I am weakest and Satan comes hardest. Guys, there's this reality that we just don't. And, and without humbleness, Scripture says, man, that he, he gives grace to the, to the humble and he humbles the proud. Uh, man, apart from humility, I'm not teachable. You, you can't teach somebody who's already got it all figured out. We teach people who are humbled. The Spirit can speak to our hearts when we're humbled and we realize that we need him, that we need God. As we read, that was the purpose of the law for us to realize that, man, I can't meet this standard. If you can be perfect, then you don't need Jesus. If you can't, if you're not perfect, you need Jesus, period. It's not a matter of being better than the next guy or just living a good life. The best that we have to offer is but filthy rags. Perfection is the mark. If you can hit perfection, you don't need him. Otherwise, I encourage you even today, right where you sit, wherever you're at, man, give your life to Jesus. Invite him into your heart. Ask him to be Lord of your life. Turn and repent of your sin. He promises that for all those who believe, and remember, belief means belief means true belief. There's going to be some action we can see. For those who believe, he's given us the right to become children of God. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Do you believe? I encourage you to. Let's close in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for the gift of Jesus. Thank you for loving us enough to send him and giving us your Holy Spirit who teaches us from your word. Man, I pray, Lord, that we could, we would press into you all the more, even as we're nervous, even as we're struggling, even as whatever, Father. We pray, Lord, that, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would help us to get on top of this sin. Father, that we want to just shrug a shoulder and go, oh, well, God will forgive me. 
but that we will truly purpose, Father, to allow your spirit to work from the inside out, that we draw on the power that we have in your spirit who dwells in us. For you tell us we're no longer in bondage, no longer a slave to sin, but you've made us free. You Through that, through the blood of Jesus, you made us your children. Father, as always, my prayer is that anybody who's out there that might be listening that doesn't know you, my prayer is they just fall on their face and make you Lord of their life. Like literally it's a matter of just reaching out, just accepting the gift that you've given through the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, shed on the cross. And you promise to, to change us from the inside out, that you promise to, to make us what you want us to make, Father, if we'll only if we'll only submit, if we'll only agree, if we'll only allow you to work in us. That's my prayer for everybody out there. A simple prayer where they pray, God, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and be Lord of it and help me be more like your son, Jesus. Father, all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, we love you. We miss you. Reach out if you need anything. Um, if you receive Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior today, man, let somebody know. Let us know so we can pray for you. Maybe we can get you plugged into uh, some Bible study and, and getting off to, to the right foot. Thanks again. We'll talk to you soon.